Well, we are on the last part, part four of our series that we call Messy Spirituality. And if you miss any of the last few weeks' messages, not to worry, I can get you caught up very, very quickly. Basically, what we've been talking about the last three weeks is this, is the fact that we're all spiritually messy people. When I say we're spiritually messy people, I'm not just talking about the non-Christians, I'm talking about the Christians as well. Uh, and when I, say, when I say spiritually messy, I mean we are all sinners. We don't just do something wrong, we don't just make mistakes, we actually hurt other people through our words, through our actions, through what we do, through what we don't do. We hurt ourselves, and that's why we're spiritually messy people. We are messed up people. And I'm not saying this in a condemning way because I'm including myself, as I said, in the same group. We're all alike, Christians and non-Christians, we're all alike, we are spiritually messed up. Now, the fact that we are spiritually messed up, though, doesn't qualify us from being spiritual. Because we, unlike any other creation that God has made on earth, we have this longing inside every single one of us. It doesn't matter whether you're religious or not. We have this longing to get connected to our Creator God. And, and we long to be spiritual. And, and, and the question is, how can messed up people like us be spiritual? And we said that the very first step, if you want authentic spirituality, is for you to first admit and embrace the fact that we are messed up, the fact that we are sinners. doesn't mean we lower God's standard. It doesn't mean we condone sinful behavior. But it means we rely on God's grace. We rely on the fact that, God, we cannot do this on our own. We're just so messed up. We are messy people, and we need you. We need your grace in our lives. And that's what Christianity is all about. If you're not a Christian here this evening, let me tell you, Christianity is not about doing the right things. Christianity is not about performing religious duties. But Christianity is recognizing the fact that we are sinners and that we need God's grace in our life. Now today, as we conclude this series, I want to answer this very common pushback that I know a lot of Christians have. And because I used to have this pushback myself. And from time to time, I'm telling you, I still have this pushback myself as well. And it is the question, what if we keep messing up after we sin? What if we keep doing wrong things after we become a Christian? All Christians accept the message of grace, pretty much everyone, right? We believe that God is gracious to us, but not every Christian believes that God's grace has no expiry date. We believe that God's grace has a beginning and has an end. You know, after you are redeemed from your sins, after you have been set free from your sin, now it is your responsibility to take care of your spiritual health so that you don't forfeit the grace of God. You know, what if we keep sinning on purpose? That's my uh, question to you this afternoon. Because, you know, sometimes we do admit like, okay, you know, from time to time, we make mistakes, we do something that we regret, you know, we don't really mean it. But if you want to be honest, you know, if we want to be honest, we are a church, we do sin on purpose, don't we? Knowing that God is gracious, knowing that, you know, Christ has paid the penalty for our sins, we still sin. What then? Is God's grace still sufficient to cover us uh, from our sin? Will God still be gracious to me? That's the question that I want to uh, answer this evening. You know, for many years after I became a Christian, I always lived in fear. You know, I, my spirituality wasn't what you can call healthy at all. Uh, every time I... Uh, I did something wrong. Every time something bad happened to me, I always felt like it was God's punishment for me. You know, uh, maybe because I didn't pray long enough. Maybe I didn't do my quiet time. You know, every time something bad happened, I immediately thought it must be God's punishment, God's discipline for my life. I always imagined God being very disappointed in my spiritual performance. You know, I felt like God is saying, you know, I gave you Jesus Christ to die on the cross and this is how you repay me. During these years, I believe I serve a God who at the beginning was gracious to me, 
And I, I, I was very happy with that fact. That's why I became a Christian in the first place. Because, you know, I realized that, hey, I'm, I messed up. I needed God in my life. But then more and more, after I became a Christian, I believe this God somehow is becoming more of a disciplinarian kind of God. I believe that, you know, God has a very, very high expectation that I can never achieve in my life as a Christian. And... And that's why I, I, was, I felt condemned quite a lot. I felt like I was not a very good Christian. I felt like at any moment, at any time, I could very easily lose God's grace in my life. God could very easily take back His love from me. Until I got slapped in the face by what the Apostle Paul wrote in his letter to the Romans, um, in his letter to the Roman Christians. And in Romans 8, verse 38, we have it up here on the screen. Paul says this, and, and from time to time, I needed to hear this again and again in my life. From time to time, this is the verses that I always go back to because I can't rely on my emotion. I can't rely on my feelings. I need to rely on the solid foundation of what God says about who I am. I need to rely on what God says about His love, about His grace in my life. And, and, and Paul says this, and in, earlier in verse 35, Paul says, Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Uh, and the answer is nothing. And in verse 38, he said, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The bottom line is this. Paul is saying we're all stuck with God's love, whether we like it or not, whether we want to be or not, we're all stuck with the love of God. The word nor anything else means nothing can stop God from loving us. Nothing. He's just going to keep loving us regardless whether you want to or not, regardless whether you like it or not. And in modern language, you could actually paraphrase this. Because nor anything else means anything else. That means nothing, absolutely nothing, shall be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So you can, you can paraphrase this to say this. For example, neither our failures, nor our poor church attendance, neither our reluctance to pray, our inadequate Bible reading, Neither our denial, nor doubt, nor insecurity, nor guilt, nor bad theology, bad temper, selfishness, nor anything else in all creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, He loves us when we obey Him. He loves us when we disobey Him. Some of you might find that hard to believe. He loves us when our life is straight. He loves us when our lives are a mess. And Mike Iaconelli, who wrote the book, said his love is sticky. I like that, you know, like super glue, stronger than super glue. His love is sticky, resistant to rejection, aggressive and persistent. Many years ago, there was a movie, a great movie called The Great Santini. And the main character is named Bull Mitchum, played by Robert Duvall, one of my favorite actors. Bull Mitchum is a soldier, and he has a wife and four kids. The biggest one or the oldest one is Ben. He used to be very close to his oldest son, Ben, until he grows up to be a bit more mature, and the relationship grows further and further apart. One evening, Bull Mitchum comes home drunk and begins to physically abuse his wife, hearing his Mother screams, the children jump out of their beds and quickly goes, go downstairs. Ben, the oldest son, grabs Bull Mitchum by the collar and throws him to the wall. And the other kids were hold, are holding his hands and his, and his feet. And when the screaming and the crying finally die down, Bull Mitchum backs away and he storms out of the house, leaving his wife and his children behind. Later, after his brother's have gone to bed, Ben speaks to his mom. And his mother, standing on the porch, says, I'm getting worried. Your father may be in trouble. And Ben says, good, I hope he dies. I want you to go and get him, his mom says. 
So Ben reluctantly goes outside and looks for his dad. And at last he finds Bull slumped against a tree, mumbling a sad imaginary words, imaginary conversations with his dad who's already passed away. So Ben, the son, listens to his father's tearful words and he begins to understand why his dad acts the way he does. So finally, Bull lays down on the grass, crying his eyes out, and his son stoops to pick him up and says to him, Come on, Dad, let's go home. I think I understand you now. Let's go home. As he picks up his father, he gently says, I love you, Dad. But Bull Mitchum pushes him away and staggers across the field, and Ben, angry at first, keeps shouting and screaming at him, Dad, I love you, Dad. I love you, Dad. And then his dad, you know, tried to go around him, but Ben tries to stop him. Dad, I love you, on top of his lung. Dad, I love you. Try to stop me. Try to stop me. I love you. I love you. Try to stop me. Until finally, Bull Mitchum understands that he can never get away from his son's um, love. So, finally, Ben embraces him and brings him home because... Bull Mitchum understand that he can never escape from his son's love. You know, uh, that incident, that episode in the movie, is kind of like what God's love is for us. It's very sticky, like Mike Iaconelli says. It is the love that won't get away. It's the love that is stubborn, you know. It's the love that keeps on keeping on, regardless of how we respond to his love. And, and if you... If you uh, read what Paul writes in the book of Romans, then you will understand why Paul can come to such conclusions in Romans chapter 8. Why does Paul have this lofty idea that no matter what he does, no matter what happens, neither the present nor the future, neither the angels nor demons, neither you know, height nor depth, I mean space, time, it doesn't matter. Physical beings, spiritual beings, it doesn't matter. None not even himself, can separate himself from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. How did Paul come to such conclusion? See, we have to go back to the beginning of the letter that he wrote to the Romans. The letter to the Romans is the last of the letters that he wrote to the churches. This is written in prison. You know, not too long after this, he actually got beheaded for his faith. And, and Paul, at the end of his life, has this full understanding. You know, God progressively reveals more and more things to him until he fully understands what the gospel message is all about. And Romans is like a, a Magna Carta, if you like. This is like the, the best, it's not a theological treatise, it's actually a letter that he wrote to the churches, but it could almost be like a theology book because of the depth of understanding that Paul has. So in the first three chapters, Paul explains that Jews and Gentiles, people with the law, people without the law, are basically alike. They all reject God, we all reject God, we do what we like to do, and we all have become the subject of God's wrath. That's basically the bottom line that Paul has been talking about in the first three chapters of the letter to the Romans. Whether we know the law or not, whether we keep the law or not, it doesn't matter, we're all subject uh, under God's wrath because none of us are able to keep the law perfectly. And therefore, no one can be made right with God, Paul says, by keeping the law. And then, this is where the good news is. If you're not a Christian, I'm telling you, this is what Christianity is all about. In verse 22, 22 sorry, of Romans chapter 3, Paul writes this. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ, and this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. I want you to notice the passive verb that Paul uses here. We are made right with God. It means no one can make themselves right with God, no matter how good you are. You cannot make yourself right with God. Somebody, see we here is the object, not the subject. Somebody has to make us right with God, and that somebody is God himself. Meaning that God actually made us right with Himself. How? How, this is, how can this happen? By our good works? No. 
By going to church? No. By bargaining with God? You know, God, I do this if you do this. No. Paul says, we are made right with God through faith in Jesus Christ. Paul says, this offer from God to be made right with Him is available to everyone. Whether you are Jew or Gentile, you know the law, you don't know the law, it doesn't matter. This offer is made available to everyone, to every single person. Whether you are a law keeper or not, it doesn't matter. Everyone who believes, Paul says, everyone who believes will be made right with God. If you're not a Christian, I said so before, this is a very good news in this. The question is, why can't we be made right with God doing our own things? Why can't we be made right with God through our religious performance? Why can't we be made right with God through offerings, through sacrifices, through all these things? Why? Paul explains why in verse 23. For everyone has sinned and falls short of God's glorious standard. No matter how good you are, Paul says. I know some of you are very, very religious people. Let me tell you, Paul says. I am more religious than any of you. I learned the law from when I was young. I learned from the best of the best. I was zealous in my Judaism. If anyone can brag about the law, if anyone can brag about their religiosity, I am that person. In another part, Paul says that. But he realizes one very important truth that is common to everyone, regardless of who you are, what background you have, uh, you know, what, what religious background you have, what racial background you have. He says, for everyone has sin, and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Now, we Christians tend to use this verse as an, evan- as an evangelism verse, don't we? We use this verse to, to speak to the non-Christians. You know, actually Christianity is not like what you think, uh, because we all have sin. We all have fallen short of God's glorious standard. That's why we need Jesus, you see, which is not wrong. I use this verse a lot because it's a very important verse for everyone to realize, for everyone to know that everyone has sinned. But notice the change in tense one more time. See, when you read Paul, all right, when you read Paul, you've got to pay attention to the grammar because the grammar is very important. God chooses to convey his message to us through the medium of language. And language has its restriction. So you've got to pay attention to the language. Paul says, for everyone has sinned. That is a perfect tense. I mean, it's, like it's common, it's happened, right? Everyone has sinned. But then he changed to present tense. He says, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. What that means is, whether you're Christian or not, you still fall short. Of God's glorious standard. You still fall short today. Mother Teresa, when she was alive, still falls short of God's standard. What does that mean? Because God's standard is perfection. No one is perfect. All has sinned. So no matter how good you are, whether you it, it doesn't matter whether it's before or after you become a Christian, we are all basically the same. We all fall short of the standard the high standard, which is perfection, that God has set. If you are a Christian and you want to be honest with me today, you know this is true, right? You love Jesus. You wish you're able to do everything that Jesus tells you to do, but you fall short, don't you? And that messes you up. You don't know how to deal with that sometimes. Sometimes you don't feel like you're God's son. You don't feel like you're God's daughter. You feel like, oh man, you know, I did it again. Like Britney, you sing the song, oops, I did it again. Right? And you wonder, like, why? Am I gonna ever going to get over this? You know, what's going to happen? Um, one Christian author called Rachel Evans said this. This is very, very revealing, very, very true. I, I see a lot of myself in what she says here. Uh, she wrote two books, um, very good books. Uh, and in one of the books, she wrote this. I've known Jesus for as long as I've known my name. I mean, she grew up a Christian. And still, I use people like capital to advance my own interests. Still, I gossip to make myself feel important. Still, I curse my brothers and sisters in one breath and sing praise songs in the next. Still, I sit in church with arms folded and cynicism coursing through my bloodstream. 
Still, I talk a big game about caring for the poor without doing much to change my own habits. Still, I indulge in food I'm not hungry for, in jewelry I don't need. Still, I obsess over what people say about me on the internet. Still, I forget my own privilege. Still, I talk more than I listen. I complain more than I thank. Still, I commit the acts of evil. Still, I make a greater commenter on Christianity and a lousy practitioner of it. That's from someone who's written two spiritual books, best-selling books, Screw up, who's grown up as a Christian all her life. That's how she feels. Christians are not. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Until we die, or until we are raptured, meet Jesus in the sky, you know, that's going to be us. And you have to embrace that. You have to live with that. You have to learn how to deal with that. And, and Paul continues in verse 24. Paul says, But God, by His grace, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. See, the NLT uses undeserved kindness, which is the best definition of grace that you can think of. You know, it's short, it's precise, but the Greek word that is used by Paul is charis, meaning grace. You know, uh, those of you who has a daughter with the name Caris or Carista. It means grace. But God, by His grace, meaning undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when He freed us from the penalty of our sins. And this is huge. I want you to pay attention, all right? If you've been sleeping the last 15 minutes, this is the time to wake up because this is good. This is important. He said, for everyone has sinned. Right? Earlier, one verse earlier, he said, Everyone has sinned, and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. But God, he says, we all have problem. But God, and this is huge, this is so important, because our usual approach to God is how? God, you know, I, I, I just, I, I realize I messed up, I've done something bad, but I'm going to do better. God, I haven't talked to you in a while, but I will try to pray more. God, I, I screw this one up, but I'm going to make it up. You know, we make all kinds of promises to God. We keep some of them for a little bit. You know, we fail to keep most of them. But our approach to God, we think God will like it. You know, when we bargain with Him, God will like it. We say, oh God, I did something wrong, but I, I promise I won't do it again. Oh God, God, I, I, you know, I, I'll, do, I'll do better. Paul says, here's a new day, my friend. Let me tell you, we all have sinned. We all fall short still of God's standard. But God, by His grace, with undeserved kindness, kindness that you don't deserve because you keep failing Him, you keep making promises you can't keep, still, God, by His grace, declares that we are righteous. And no one knows this truth more than Paul. Who is Paul? He used to be called Saul. He's the persecutor of Christianity. He's a Christian killer. He literally, he used to be a Christian killer. If anyone deserves to die for his sins, if anyone deserves punishment, if anyone deserves... You know, all the bad things to happen to him, Paul would be that person. That's why, you know, he says at the end of his life, I'm the worst of all sinners. I'm not even worthy to be counted among the apostles. That's why I believe when Paul writes this, I'm not surprised if Paul writes this with tears in his eyes. But God, by his grace, with undeserved kindness to me, you can replace this almost with his, you know, to become personal. But God, by His grace, with the kindness that I don't deserve, declares me, Paul, who used to be called Saul, righteous. Can you imagine? God declaring Paul righteous. He did this to, through Christ Jesus. How did God declare us righteous? God is a just God. He cannot just declare you righteous because God is a just God. Justice has to be fulfilled, correct? God cannot, you know, I know God can do everything, but God, God cannot deny His own character. See, God cannot tell a lie. 
God cannot deny His own sense of justice. Justice must be carried out. So how can God declare us righteous when we are messed up, when we are sinners? Paul explains, He did this through Christ Jesus who freed us from the penalty of our sin. Let me ask you, what tense is the word freed here? What tense is it? What tense? It's past tense. Past tense, see, in the, in the Greek, Greek has a lot more tenses than, than English. The, but very, very similar. You know, they have like crossover a little bit. The sense here is like it's done in the past and it's over. It's done with. God has freed us once and for all from our sins, Paul says. You know, through his death on the cross, God has made this complete payment. It's a done deal. You have been set free from your sins once and for all. It doesn't matter. You don't need to bargain with God anymore. You don't need to go, God, I will do this. I promise you. You don't need to do that anymore, Paul says. Because you have been set free. You have been freed from your sins. That's why Paul can say what he said in Romans 8. Now, you understand, now that I've been set free from sin for good, now I know now, I am convinced, I am convinced, because I've been paid in full, that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor, pow- nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. See, the reason why Paul is so confident in this, the reason why he even writes, nor anything else, in case he misses out, what could possibly separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus? What could possibly, can I think of anything else in the whole world that could possibly separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus? He said, I can't think of anything else, but just in case, let me write it down nor anything else in all creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The reason why Paul is confident is not because of his performance, it's not because he believes he's the best of the best of the apostles and he deserves the, the grace of God, he deserves the salvation that comes from God. No. In fact, in Romans 7, just one chapter before this, if you read what the struggles that he has, he says, you know, I am so condemned. Not, not that so condemned. That what I want to do, I don't do. But the things I'm not supposed to do, these are the things that I keep on doing. Who shall rescue me from this body of death? He was frustrated with himself. And then Romans 8 is the answer. But thanks be to God who freed us from this power of sin. You know, if you are a Christian who always count on your performance, you believe that you deserve everything that you have right now because you are faithful in church attendance, because you read your Bible, because you uh, you have have always tried to do the right thing by God. You realize you're not perfect, but you kind of feel like, yeah, you know, no wonder God saved me. I'm telling you to repent right now because that's not the reason why God blessed you. That's not the reason why God saved you, you know? You can't count. You can't be confident in your own performance. Isaiah said, our good deeds are like filthy rags in God's sight. You know, that's how bad we are. That's how messed up we are. William Carey, the, uh, the missionary to India, he is actually known as the father of modern missions. He wrote uh, to one of his sons when he was about 70 years old. And, and he wrote this. We have it up here. William Carey says, and, and this is coming from like almost a saint, right? I mean, he practically gave up his life for the Indian people. If there are a lot of Christians in India right now, that's because of William Carey, William Carey's influence. He translated the Bible to so many Indian languages. Uh, This guy is amazing. But this is what he, he wrote to one of his sons. I'm this day 70 years old, a monument of divine mercy and goodness. Though on a review of my life, I find much, very much, for which I ought to be humbled in the dust. My direct and positive sins are immunerable. My negligence in the Lord's work has been great. I have not promoted His cause, nor I sought His glory. 
and honor as I ought, notwithstanding all this, I am spared until now, and I'm still retained in His work, and I trust I'm received into the divine favor through His grace. You know, even William Carey realized, man, what a wretched person I am. You know, I'm supposed to do things that I don't do. You know, I'm supposed to carry out the work of God that I cannot carry out all of them. I'm not saying that we shouldn't try to be godly or we shouldn't read our Bible and pray, you know. I'm not, I'm not saying that at all. Uh, in fact, you know, I want you to be consistent in your church attendance. You know, I, a lot of people are not consistent anymore in their church attendance. I want you to read your Bible. I want you to pray. We always talk about that in the first three weeks, all right? But uh, if you're one of those Christians who trust in your own good works, all right, in your own effort to get close to God or to be loved by God, I want you to listen to what Brennan Manning has to say. Uh, Brent Manning, he wrote a lot of great books, like Muffin Gospel, uh, Gospel, you know, uh, Abba, Father. He, he wrote this, May all your expectations be frustrated. May all your plans be thwarted. May all your desires be withered into nothingness that you may experience the paralysis and poverty of a child and sing and dance in the compassion of God who is Father, Son, and Spirit. Amen and amen. In other words, Brent Manning said, you know, don't ever come to God with this idea that you are good enough to come into His presence, but come to Him like a child, understanding that, you know, we are basically messy people, you know, and we need God's grace every single day of our life. Singer Rich Mullins, um, who wrote, Our God is an awesome God and all that. Uh, Actually, he died in a car accident, quite tragic. When I was in America in 1996, he died in 1997. You know, the song was very popular. You know, it was sung all over the churches in America. Our God is an awesome God. He he wrote this. And and when I I read this, I said, wow, Rich Mullins got it right. I totally agreed with him. Rich Mullins said this, I would rather live on the verge of falling and let my security be in the all-sufficiency of the grace of God than to live in some kind of pietistic illusion of moral excellence. Not that I don't want to be morally excellent, but my faith isn't in the idea that I'm more moral than anybody else. My faith is in the idea that God and His love are greater than whatever sins any of us commit. Um, I find it sad that many Christians believe that they are saved by grace through faith alone, but they spend their entire Christian life trying to get God's approval by their works. You know? Yes, it is important for us to be as, as holy as we can. It is important for us. In, in fact, if, even, if, you, if you do it out of selfish reason for all, your own quality of life, you'll be much better off doing things God's way than doing things your own way. Let me tell you that right now, right? But let's not confuse the grace of God with the good works that God wants us to do, okay? Uh, Wayne Jacobson said this, The sad truth is that most Christians spend their entire lives trying to score points with someone who is not keeping score. Is that you? You try to score points, get brownie points from God, uh, and, and God, all the while, does not keep score. You know, your, your effort is in vain. You know, God cannot love you anymore. God cannot love you any less, no matter what you do. But our actions do have consequences. You know, our actions, sometimes God, because He's a loving Father, do discipline us from time to time, you know, just to get us back on the right track. I still believe in all that, right? But don't try to keep score with God. It is not necessary. Our problem is that we don't really believe that Jesus loves us as we are. We don't really believe that Jesus loves us, that God loves us unconditionally. And I know that's, that's our propensity, you know, because we live in a performance-based world. Everything we do is performance-based in this world. So it's very difficult for us to re- receive it. And we understand it here, but we, we can't receive it here. And that's why I keep telling Jaden again and again, hey, Jaden, you know, I love you no matter what. I love you no matter what. I want Jaden to know that my love for him is not conditional upon his performance. Every night before he goes to bed, I sing him a song. You know, I, I wrote this song myself. You know, I, you, know, you know, I must have loved my son very much when I, who can't sing, actually wrote a song and actually sing to him every night. You want to hear it? 
I think I've sang it before, right? It goes like this. Jaden, my son. It's terrible, I know. <laughs> I said, it goes like this. Jaden, my son. Daddy loves you no matter what you do. You're the best. You're the best. Daddy's boy. Yeah. <laughs> I want him to know, you know, and he can sing it along. You know, he got tired of singing that, singing that song, but it doesn't matter, you know. I have another song that I sing to him, but I sing to you next time. Uh, um, but think about this, right? And I'm close, I'll close with this. If I, imperfect father as I am, I want Jaden to be confident of my love for him. You know, I, I won't be able to give him a Jaguar probably. I, I can't give him everything that he wants. But there's nothing that I want more for him than for him to realize that, hey, my dad loves me unconditionally. I don't want him to doubt my love for him. You know? And, and think about this just for 30 more seconds with me. If I, the imperfect father, doesn't want my son to doubt my love, Imagine this. How much more God, your heavenly Father, God, your heavenly Father, doesn't want you to doubt His love for you. That's the worst thing in the world for God if He can't communicate to you how much He loves you, how much He unconditionally loves you, how much He's so gracious to you. You know, at the end of this series, my, my only request to you is be gracious toward yourself because God has been gracious to you. Be gracious toward other people. You know, Christianity has been condemned by people outside for being ungracious. And that, that shouldn't be the message that we send. We should be, of all people, the most gracious because we have received God's grace first, right? You have, been, you have to be gracious to yourself because God has been gracious to you. If God doesn't condemn you anymore, who are you to condemn yourself, right? Don't live the life of sin, of course. Be better. Honor God with your life. Honor God with your money. Honor God with your talent. But don't beat, over, don't beat yourself every time you fail because God wants you to keep growing in your faith. His grace is sufficient for you. Pastor Mike is going to lead us in a song. I, I love this song. The lyric says, Only by grace can we enter. Only by grace can we stand not by our human endeavor but only by the blood of the lamb as pastor mike sings this i want you to ponder and reflect on god's love and amazing grace for you. if you come here this evening not knowing where you stand before god i want you to be very very sure because god wants you to be very very sure where you stand before him the Bible says, For God so loves the world that He gave His one and only Son. Whoever believes in Him will not die, but have an everlasting life. I want you to know, God wants you to know, that He loves you so much that He sent His Son, Jesus, to die on the cross to pay for your sins. God doesn't look at your mistakes anymore. As far as the east is from the west, the Bible says, that's how far God has removed your sins from you. You've already been forgiven 2,000 years ago when Christ died on that cross and when He says, it is finished. It is paid for. The only access for you to that forgiveness, the only thing you need to do is to have faith in Him, to believe Him, to trust Him, that, that you will not trust in your own good works, but you will trust in His finished work at the cross. You will trust His grace instead of your own effort. That's the only thing that God wants from you. He doesn't want anything from you. He wants something for you. He wants eternal life for you. He wants you to spend eternity with Him. So this evening, I want to give you that opportunity. I'm going to pray. And if you want to be included in that prayer, I just want you to, to raise your hands and just say, that's me, Daniel, you know. Uh, I don't understand everything that you said, but I understand enough to know that I'm a sinner and I need God's grace in my life. Without anybody looking around, just 
just raise your hand and say, that's me. Please include me in your prayer. I want to I wanna accept God's grace in my life. Yeah, I see it. Anybody else? Yeah, I see it. Praise God. Don't be embarrassed. This is not between you and me. This is not between you and the church. It has nothing to do with the rocks, nothing to do with the church. It's something to do with you and your Creator God. God wants to make it right with you. God takes the first step when He sent Jesus to die on the cross. And all you need to do is to respond in faith and believe Him for it. Anybody else? Just raise your hand. Yeah, I see it. Let's pray. For those of you who raise your hand, I see it. For those of you who raise your hands, I want you to repeat after me. And God looks at your heart. You know, it's not the words. Don't worry about the words. But God looks at your heart. If you mean what you say, I'm telling you, heaven is rejoicing. Angels are clapping because one lost person now comes home. So all you need to do is just mean what you say. So I want you to repeat after me. And I want all the Christians to repeat after me as well as, as a sign of support for our new brothers and sisters in Christ. So repeat after me. Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. You in Jesus name. I realize I'm a sinner. I realize I'm a sinner. There's nothing I can do to save myself. You have done everything for me. You died on the cross for my sins. You paid it all in full. My sins of yesterday, today, even tomorrow. I'm the recipient of eternal life. Not because I'm good, but because you are good. And that's your promise to me. So I believe Jesus as my Savior once and for all. Help me to follow you all the days of my life. I want you to clap your hands for those who pray that prayer for the first time. God is good. And I'm telling you, if you pray that prayer for the first time, we want to know about it. If you let us know, uh, we're going to have water baptism soon. You know, register to be baptized. You don't need to wait around, you know. There's no requirement because God and His grace is all that you need, all right? So why don't you open up your hands right now. Let's be dismissed in God's grace. Church, let's go back from this place, understanding, being renewed in our zeal toward God, understanding that nothing we do is enough to separate His love from us. May that motivate you toward godly living. May that motivate you toward repentance. May that motivate you to live better and better. Not because you want to win God's love. You already have God's love. Not to win His favor. You already have His favor. But because you want to honor Him. You want to be grateful. You want to acknowledge Him every day of your life. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Savior, and the fellowship, the power, the anointing of the Holy Spirit be with you always. Be with your family, your work, your ministry, your children, their studies, their relationship. May God bless everything that you do so that through you, people will be blessed both now and forevermore. All God's people who are blessed, say it together with me now. Amen, amen. God bless you, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend.